Next, CityNet 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is made possible in part by TCI and is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. Good afternoon. Welcome to the City Club of Portland. I'm Pete Heuser, your president. As you know, today's speaker is Gretchen miller Kafori, outgoing city commissioner. Uh, we're going to have a couple of announcements first. Uh, we have no program next Friday so that we can enjoy the Thanksgiving weekend. On Wednesday, December 2nd, there's a breakfast meeting with John Kavistad, Metro Council Chair, who will discuss the expansion of the urban growth boundary. Now we need you to pre-register for that program, so please call the club office if you can attend. It's a breakfast meeting at 7.30 at the Benson Hotel again on December 2nd. On Friday, December 4th, we're going to hear a presentation by Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals Judge Susan Graber and Assistant U.S. Attorney for Oregon, Okemer Christian Dark, who will discuss gender in the justice system. Our program today is sponsored by Lane Powell Spears Laberski, Weyerhaeuser Corporation, and CH2M Hill. We continue to be very grateful for their support. Good. <laughs> That's Dan. He's a treasure. It's very important to him. We have a new member in the audience today, Matteo Lucio. Would you stand up, please? Good. Matteo is managing editor of Oregon's Future magazine. Now this month's edition has an article by Pauline Anderson in it, and I understand there's some copies on the back table. Her article is on domestic violence, and it's a follow-up on the City Club study, which she chaired on that topic. Thank you. Welcome to the club. Now as many of you know, the first time Gretchen miller Kafori became involved in the City Club was from outside the club's doors. She and a small group of women formed an organization they called POW for politically oriented women and began picketing the club. <laughs> POW. Good. A lot of the members are here. Good. And they began picketing the club back in 1971 so that they would, uh, the club would admit women to its membership. Now supposedly as a result of one of the women being pinched by a club member, Gretchen was elevated to the post of head of security with POW. Now, I'm not sure that pinching incident actually happened. Maybe it was just a ploy to keep their cause on the front page. But uh, after more than two years of picketing, the club finally voted to admit women, and that was 25 years ago last month. From oh, yeah, good. We certainly... We appreciate her efforts and, and all of yours for changing us. It was a change that was probably late in coming. Some of us call it the City Club's finest hour. It probably was, but it was too late. We thank you for your efforts. During their race, they participated in the debate here at the City Club. In that debate, Mr. Koch made reference to her unsuccessful proposal of a real estate transfer tax to provide money for homeless shelters. At her urging, the tax had been sent to voters and had been resoundingly defeated. She asked, uh, he asked how she could be so out of touch with the electorate. She responded that she would never apologize for supporting programs to end homelessness, and she would continue to work for them. And that's exactly what she's been doing in the Portland City Council. Incidentally, the real estate transfer tax was ultimately adopted, showing that she was ahead of the curve, and she was able to lead the community where she thought it should go. Now, back in 1990, before Gretchen took office, Bud Clark was asked what he was going to do with the serious housing problems which Portland had at the time, particularly as it related to affordable housing. Now, he knew Gretchen had the background to take on the job. Well, she accomplished so much, she was dubbed not, not the housing czar, but the housing czarina. Now, we didn't hear much about affordable housing then, but Gretchen has been instrumental in bringing that issue to the fore. While on the city council, 
Gretchen pushed through an affordable housing preservation ordinance which will protect over 2,000 units for low-income, elderly, and disabled citizens. But she's also been successful in obtaining increased funding for the arts. And she's been in charge of the Bureau of Fire and Emergency Services and Emergency Communications, the Office of Neighborhood Involvement, and the Regional Arts and Culture Commission. She's certainly had a full plate. Now, when Gretchen leaves the City Council, she'll still be with us working at Portland State, where she'll combine teaching with directing the PSU internship program. We'll see her again, but we wanted to recognize her long-term relationship with the club. She's spoken to us on four prior occasions, and we put together videotapes of each of those presentations, and we have them here for you, Gretchen. So enjoy. Uh, it, it, I, it's not going to put you to sleep, so don't listen to them at night. There they are. Also, Gretchen, you can stand up. I want to give you a pin, a Portland uh, City Club pin, which I'm sure you'll wear proudly. I had planned to pin it on you, but I think I won't. Uh, so there it is. So let's, let's welcome Gretchen miller Kafori, outgoing commissioner and former head of security for POW. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Terry, is this another too tall podium for me? It's a little joke. Um, I have to confess that sometimes in the last few weeks I've felt more like a dead duck than a lame duck, but I guess that's what I am. Um, I did want to take one minute, if you'll indulge me, and introduce several people that are very important to me that are here today. Um, first of all, my two lovely daughters, Catherine Richardson and Deborah Kafori. They're here. My high, my, it's not high school, my college roommate, though it's almost 40 years, Lynn Regal from Tacoma. <laughs> and my beloved sister, Debbie Bonds, who has been saying for the last 16 years that she's temporarily living in Nebraska. I'm beginning to think she has abandoned her roots here, but Debbie Bonds came to see me too. <laughs> also, I'm just ecstatic I think this is a illegal quorum or whatever Bob what do you think about that Bob Young was running around yesterday at our conference saying we had an illegal meeting of the City Council so here's another one for their for their records but my colleagues are mayor Vera Katz thank you for coming Vera my other my other colleagues Jim Francisconi Charlie Hales Eric Sten and my former colleague, Mike Lindbergh. And I, Pauline has already gotten mentioned, but she and I served mostly happily together at the Multnomah County Commission. Okay, those of you who have been with me on this strange and wondrous journey know that I rarely write a speech. I usually give ad lib remarks despite the best efforts of my wonderful staff. Oh my God, I forgot my staff, my wonderful, <laughs> long-suffering, beleaguered staff. Would you stand up too? <laughs> they have been incredible. My uh, moods have been variable in the last few months. Uh, during this time, of course, you began the recalling process, and it has been fun to think and reflect and, and do a little bit of that, but I find that writing things down is the only way I can even be moderately coherent, so I hope you'll indulge me with a little more formal reflection, and then we can have questions and have fun. After weeks of thought and way too much material, I've focused on three questions. Why am I leaving elective office now? What were the highlights? And what's left undone? What are the challenges for the next generation of political leaders? The questions about why I didn't run again for elective office, I'm going to offer you 
the David Letterman list of 10. <laughs> and all of them have at least some truth. So you can figure out which part. One, nothing has ever been as fun as picketing the city club 25 years ago <laughs> when I got to wear a helmet and march around the Benson. Right, Vera? <laughs> that was fun. I can't take another management fad of the month, too. <laughs> TQM, core, quality improvement. I just, I, I'm finished with that. I hope Portland State doesn't have them. In a serious, more serious vein, number three is that the problems we face today are the same ones we've faced for 20 to 30 years. And unfortunately, I find I have no new answers in a lot of arenas, from guns, education funding, the Willamette River, tax structure, youth violence, childcare, domestic violence, and even billboards, my friends. I can easily feel that I've been running in one of those wheels like the rats do. Number four, I'm tired of being yelled at at the grocery store and in the elevator of my building over anything government does. <laughs> one of my favorites was this summer when one of our more cranky residents said that the swimming pool wasn't working and it was the city's fault. <laughs> now figure that one out. Number five, as Willamette Week put it recently, and not kindly either, she is finally retiring after holding political office since Carter was president. <laughs> Number six, I want to work more with students and young people. Seven, I want to get a dog and spend more time at the beach. Eight, I want to take piano lessons again and read more. Nine, my body is definitely sending me signals that I need to slow down. If you may know that four weeks ago today I was up visiting our friends at Good Sam, so I think that was a bit of a wake-up call. And 10, it's time for Gen X to bring their energy, new ideas, and enthusiasm to solving the problems facing us. The good news, the really good news, is that these young buckaroos, as I call them, are r rising in numbers significantly as a result of November 3rd. We have Eric Sten, of course, Chris Beck, Serena Cruz was newly elected, and Ryan Deckert. There's just a lot of them. Oh, did I forget Deborah Kafori? Oh. <laughs> They're all finding their passion in politics and we'll be enhancing the public debate tremendously for some time to come. Another frequently asked question are, what are some of the highlights? And I want to run through some that have been especially rewarding and challenging. I entered politics because of the feminist movement, first and foremost, and my earliest memories were of tremendous gains for women. In 1973, we quickly ratified the ERA I was working for Eleanor Davis, if I may di divert from my speech. Um, and in 1977, when a, bi a bill to repeal the ratification was introduced in our committees, we substituted the words reaffirm for repeal and passed it out with Drew Davis's name still on the bill. <laughs> in 1977, we adopted a mandatory arrest bill for domestic violence victims, for the perpetrators of domestic violence. And of course, back in 73, we had passed the equal credit law. It was a heady time indeed. I chaired the delegation to the National Houston Women's Conference, uh, sponsored, I might add, Bob, by Jimmy Carter, President <laughs> Carter to you. Um, and we were recognized by states across the country and sought out to give our opinions and talk about how we had done these incredible things during the 70s in the Oregon legislature. A final legislative gain I wanted to mention for women was the adoption of the marriage license tax, which helps fund the domestic violence shelter system. And I'm proud, bringing it up to the present to note, 
that local government contribution to this issue has increased tenfold in the decade since Pauline and I were elected to the County Commission, which is indeed a significant increase in commitment to this program. Another area of fond memories for me was opening up the healthcare field to practitioners other than doctors. Sorry if I'm stepping on any toes here. The nurse practitioner legislation was fought hard by the OMA, but common sense prevailed and a few good words from Dr. John Kitzhaber didn't hurt either. And the nurse practitioners practice fine and compassionate medicine today. We also opened reimbursement for social workers, chiropractors, optometrists, and others who were not MDs, giving many patients increased access to health care. The years at Multnomah County were very challenging as we tried to balance the outcry for jail beds with some modest resources for mental health, alcohol and drug treatment, and education, usually the reasons people are in jail in the first place. I would say that given the prison building boom of the last decade, though, that Pauline and I have kind of lost our battle on that one, but we did win a significant battle for teen health clinics, and a lot of Portland's kids are getting better health care as well because of our efforts. The eight years at the city have focused primarily on rebuilding Portland's neighborhoods using community development tools. I am not naive enough to believe that the community development corporations, the CDCs, that we have supported did this alone. The market and tons of support from a variety of sectors have kept Portland's neighborhoods from falling into despair and poverty that are typical of many neighborhoods across the country. But the CDC movement has been very, very active here, and I'm proud of our support for that. They have grown in number from five to over 20 today. And I urge those of you who aren't familiar with our fine network of community development corporations to learn more about it. We didn't give it a fancy name or call attention to it, but a wonderful, in a wonderful, quiet way, I think Portland is a better place, not just for our land use planning and bike lanes and the traditional things we think about with Portland, but for the vitality and vibrance of neighborhoods and the energy and commitment put forth by our citizens in this rebuilding. Other activity was mentioned. Peter mentioned the very progressive preservation ordinance that Susan Emmons is a cheerleader for to protect our stock of low rent housing. And in December, hopefully, we will finally update the city's housing policy, which hasn't been done in 20 years. I really do like the moniker of Housing Tsarina. I think it's a, a great step up from socialist, which I've also been called. <laughs> and in fact, very recently I've been called. <laughs> it's not just my old days. Uh, another initiative of the past decade, which makes me very proud, is the Shelter Reconfiguration Plan. We set out an ambitious restructuring of the local homeless system for singles. We now have four smaller and specialized programs for homeless men, two, homeless women, one, and chronically mentally ill homeless adults. Unfortunately, we have not solved the problem or ended homelessness, as many of us hoped we would be able to, but we certainly have built a system which offers hope and the possibility for change, rather than putting homeless people in jail for being poor. A final delight for me was being able to lead the effort to increase public support for the arts. Bill wouldn't speak to me again if I didn't mention the arts. The statistics are grim. Oregon is right at the bottom of the ratings for public financial commitment to arts organizations, even though we tout cultural tourism as one of our economic development strategies. The city made a major financial commitment to the arts this year, and I believe the whole community will be richer. I was especially moved by NEA Director Ivy's comments here at the City Club last week, where he talked about the arts as the creative infrastructure of our communities and maybe that's the link we need to make to 
increase and enhance the public support for arts. This has been fun because those of you who know me know that my degree from Whitman College was in music. And I remember being at a, a reunion of some kind a few years ago and asking my choral conducting teacher what in the world that music training had done to prepare me for a life in politics. And he thought and said, well, you talk very artistically with your hands. <laughs> so. What are you leaving undone is another question. Or maybe this, in a touch, gets back to why I'm not running for elective office again. But what, it, what do I have regrets about? It's no secret that I've been unhappy with the functioning of the city council. I debated about being totally gracious and leaving this subject alone today, but I am fearful that the cry for reform of the city government will be the conclusion when complaints about the way the city council works together are raised, and I do not support this notion. I think Portland's, Portlanders have a wonderfully accountable local government. If your street has serious traffic problems, you call Hales. If dogs are loose in your public park, you call Francisconi. <laughs> if it's fish or pollution in the river, fish with four eyes or deformed fins, you call Sten. And for police issues, you call the mayor. What major city has this accessibility and accountability for their citizens? My deep that dissatisfaction comes because lately, at times, I feel the city council does not act as a board of directors. Egos, paranoia, getting the credit have, in my opinion, superseded the public good and the potential to use five bright, capable people to solve critical public problems. These characteristics added to the turf battles that are rampant in any institution have nearly paralyzed the city at times. I believe I share some of the responsibility for this dysfunction and perhaps a new face is just what the council needs, especially given the failure of some very important bond levies in the last election. I do hope that the team will work more closely together in the future. A second deep sadness for me is the lack of civility and discourse that is taking place. We struggle with it through the Office of Neighborhood Involvement. I believe it's very deep and that as a society, we've lost a lot of the common good that motivated people in decades past. And the uniqueness of America, the combining of fierce individualism with a collective good mentality that de Tocqueville wrote about almost 200 years ago, I'm afraid we're losing this. The subject is being discussed, analyzed, written about, and many organizations, including the city, list changing this in their goals. It's usually couched as rebuild public confidence in government but I honestly don't believe we have found the way to do this. We still dream up schemes and try to sell them to the public. Many individuals are so negative and hostile about government that any process is inadequate. Fear, misperception, demagoguery, there's rooms for lots of blame in this equation. Portland is a treasure. We have 100 active neighborhood organizations and seemingly endless demand for process and citizen involvement. But I do fear without the ability to sit and reason together, to find common ground, even in hot issues like abortion and change and growth, we're going to be in very deep trouble. It seems unconscionable that at a time when we know about mediation, about the skill of how to mediate and resolve disputes, we are not using it more to settle our disagreements. Dispute resolution, communication, decision making are not taught as basic skills in most schools. And our ability 
to work together peacefully and respectfully is threatened. Another fear, and I'm sure after yesterday, those of us that participated in the conference are uh, very aware that we are moving away from our financial commitment to fund the services we critically need. This funding for basic services is studied and debated and discussed, same as mediation and citizen participation, but I don't think we have found adequate answers. Some of the phrases that we repeatedly hear are that European citizens happily pay 50% of their incomes in taxes, what's wrong with us? Or CEOs earn 3,000 times the wage of their workers, what's wrong with this picture? Um, I do think there's truth to these, but I do believe that we need to spend much more collective energy trying to address how to get beyond this. The defeat of these key local ballot measures that were mentioned, the light rail, I guess it was mentioned to me by Ned, um, the light rail and the parks, education, these were, I think, a surprise to most of us in this room that they were defeated. And we need to, we really have got to find solutions for this or our community will not have the kind of future we all want. My very uh, specific concern is for public education. At a recent Reed College Women's Forum, I was asked in the question and answer period, what, what would I do if I had $50 million to spend tomorrow? And without hesitating, I said I would give it to the Portland Public Schools. Uh, for someone who has spent a decade scrapping and crawling and begging and beating people to get resources for affordable housing, in reflecting, I was surprised at my answer. But I do think, on, in retrospect, that that is the correct answer. Without capacity in our public educational system from preschool and child care to higher education, we are doomed, and this great experiment in democracy will fail because all persons will not have had access to equal opportunities. My optimistic side will point out that many of the campaigns run in Oregon, both for legislature and for county commission and city council and Congress emphasized education so I do feel that maybe 25 years after Tom McCall tried to fix education funding, we may be able to do it. In closing, the APP conference yesterday was exciting. I very much enjoyed seeing a lot of friends and people I've worked with, but I was troubled that there weren't more new faces and younger faces and that there wasn't enough specificity from the group. And this will be exactly the challenge the City Club and other community groups need to take up now. The vision is there. The commitment is there. I think the usual suspects have a common vision for Portland and especially the downtown core for the next 25 years, what we don't have or how we're going to do it. A quick anecdote was uh, when we had our legislative briefing with our uh, State, state legislators on Wednesday, the city council, and we were talking about education, which is everyone's top priority. And Eric pointed out that in fact, we had nine different solutions from nine different people. This isn't gonna get us through what we need to get through in the next six months. So hopefully that will change. The, the final part of the conference was Governor Kitzhaber reminding us that we can't just say Oregon is a special place, but we have to say Oregon is a special place for people to live. And I fear that sometimes we get so caught up in defining our livability as the visual things, the scenic beauty, the buildings, the malls, the trains, et cetera, that we forget why that livability is so important because it's the people that live here. I hope that I have made a difference for those people in the last 25 years. Thank you for allowing me to speak, and I especially wanted to thank 
Don Sterling and Sid L Lezak for allowing me to be a member of the club. <laughs> Look, um, Ned Look, a member of the Board of Governors, our board host today, will ask the first question and then we'll open it to City Club members in the audience from the mic here. <laughs> Gretchen, I'm, one, one thing I learned is don't talk, don't talk to the speaker if you're going to ha have to ask her a question at the end. She answered most of the questions as a result, part of the questions I was going to ask her. But I would, Gretchen, like to have you expand uh, on your comments about the summit meeting we had yesterday celebrating the 25th anniversary uh, of the central downtown, the expan expanded central downtown. It's, the more I look at it, we came out in favor of education number one yesterday, cleaning up the Willamette, the quality of life, parks, transportation. Every one of these were turned down at the ballot. And I, I wonder if we were being preached to as a choir and the, the preacher in the choir was not in touch with the congregation. And I wonder if you would elaborate on what, where the disconnect exists in this community when you get 400 people who are vitally interested, including many and not all of our public officials, saying one thing, and all 400 of us voting one way, and all of it being turned down at the ballot. I think that was exactly the feeling, as I said, for, for me personally, it was a reaffirming time, and we need to have those experiences. We need to gather with people of like mind and kind of pump ourselves up and, and feel the, the good, the joy that we have of accomplishing as much as we have with downtown Portland. But somehow we didn't even get into strategies. And it, for me at this point in my life, I want to get out and figure out what we could have done. If everybody in that room, those 400 people had spent one hour out campaigning for the light rail, I think it would have passed. And we love this in Oregon. We love to plan. We love to do these things and have conferences and gather together. But I find we're very short on being willing to do the action. It wasn't money that we needed in that campaign. We needed all 400 of those people, a lot of whom were businesses, to go to their business, their place of work, talk to the fellow employees, tell them how critical this is for our region. And I don't know for a fact, but I suspect that a lot of them didn't put that energy in. I remember a meeting a few years ago when we were having trouble in Vero. It was before you got to the city. We had a leaders roundtable meeting, and it was the same kind of thing. All the leaders of business and government in the city of Portland, and we were gearing up for a uh, fear f we were fearful of a summer of youth violence. So the issue was, what do we do? And Neil even came in. Neil Goldschmidt came and tried to pump us up to do something. And I finally stood up and said, how many people in this room will get five jobs for kids this summer? And there was just this deafening silence. You know, this is where I, I guess, run out of patience, finally, I know, it surprises everyone. <laughs> but it is, we love to talk, we love to vote, we love to answer questions like, should the, do you agree or disagree that the Willamette River should be cleaned up? Well, let me think. <laughs> we had seven choices, <laughs> from strongly agree to strongly disagree. Now let's figure out, should public education be supported? I'm, I don't mean to uh, diminish the work of the group yesterday, 
but let's make some action plans. How are we going to go to the legislature and convince them that we need to do this? So. Are we doing other questions? <laughs> Let me ask a question. Any well, member why? of the oh, city club, any member of the city club who was there when they didn't allow women is not allowed to ask me a question. <laughs> Except Don Sterling. Because he, he made up for it. One of those tapes is Don and me doing our thing at the city club on the 15th anniversary of integration. <laughs> yes, my fellow friend and neighbor. Yes, hi Gretchen. Erwin Mandel, City Club member. I come to uh, friends, citizens, and members of the City Club, I come to praise our housing Zarina, oh, no. not to criticize her. <laughs> uh, Ask a question, Er. <laughs> You know it always takes me a while to get to it. I know it does. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, perhaps Zarina is, a, is the correct word. It seems you are leaving a dynasty behind you, uh, aren't you, to follow you. Your daughter, biological, and perhaps we might say your psychological son also is left to help he us. He doesn't like that, Irv. You're treading in <laughs> delicate waters. <laughs> This comment has been made before. He has a mother, and it isn't me. <laughs> Remember, I said psychological. Or perhaps psychological. political. He political doesn't son. Like that either. He doesn't like that either. Uh -oh. Eric will have to get together after this. But uh, clearly, you will be leaving an effect on this city that I think, for the most part, isn't terribly beneficial. I'm perhaps not the one to evaluate that since I'm a fairly new citizen of the city, just a little over five years. I also must say I'm one of Gretchen's neighbors who have never yelled at her in Safeway, no, no matter how often we've met. Now, to the question. You've, uh, <laughs> listen, I, must, I don't see anyone standing behind me, so I thought I might be entitled to a few preliminaries. <laughs> oh. I think Charlie sent her up to cut me off. <laughs> You've uh, rightly pointed out that there are many good things that went down to defeat on the ballot. The issue is, if they were so good, why didn't the leadership of this city come up with the proper tactics to convince the voters of how good they were? Because that seems to be the failure, a tactical failure. Not a strategic one, but a tactical failure. Well, I, I will not concede, uh, if I may get on my soapbox once more, I will not concede the park's failure to any lack of leadership or commitment or energy because Jim Francisconi worked his butt off for that campaign. So I don't, you know, we don't get to have a debate here. <laughs> there was a lot of energy gone. I'm saying where we have the hardest time is getting the message in to the real people, the real workers in the business. I had a guy at my table from Pete Mark Realty yesterday. I would bet you that at least seven out of eight of major people at Pete Mark Company did not vote for light rail, for the parks, for a lot of things, despite the fact that they have property out in Washington County which will benefit from the west side max. So this is the disconnect that we have to break down and try to understand how we get, reach down into the organizations and not just talk to each other. That was my point. I think it's a tactical issue. Great. Yes. We'll meet at the Safeway <laughs> deli and talk it over. <laughs> no yelling, no, no. Jillian Detweiler, City Club member, and I guess I have you to thank for that. For women my age, I'm 33, it really is unbelievable that we didn't have access to institutions like this one and many others. And I think often we're not aware of the sacrifices your generation made to give us access. What do you think is the next phase of feminism? Are we done? Have we made it? What are the next steps? No, obviously I don't think we're done. Um, 
I think that, again, along with the political re-energization of the, of the young, the ex-PAC group and the fact that more young people now, I mean, the, under, the near 30s that are getting into politics is tremendous. I think that same age category of women, at least the women that I go to school with up at Portland State are, they have a, a different, more respectful view of the women's movement than perhaps the women of the 80s did. I mean, I've for years gone to classes up there, women's studies classes, and talked about some of the battles we won. And we could have a lot of fun telling other stories of integration besides the city club. But I think there was a period where feminism and the goals that we were trying to reach of economic and political equity, uh, social equity, were not valued. There, there were a lot of women who rejected that and felt they could do just fine by themselves, thank you very much. But I don't feel that near as much anymore. So I think we're doing what we do in life, which is cycle through and there'll be a group that does, cares about something and then a period, a decade or more that people don't. So I'm optimistic in that front, but no, I don't, what are the numbers now? Are women up to 72% yet, or Eleanor, you would know. What are the 68% on a dollar? Women's wages are 68% of men's for the same job, so we are not finished. Yes, county commissioner, one of my former interns in the legislature. <laughs> Yes, and I, I'm here to, Diane Lynn, City Club member, um, I'm here to thank you, Gretchen, for all of your support along the way and mentoring and, and all of that. And I, um, I, too, appreciate you breaking the ice for a lot of us, though I don't qualify as an ex-packer anymore. No, you uh, don't. No, 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 no yes, you don't. I was at your 40th birthday yes, you party. <laughs> thank you for that, Gretchen. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, <laughs> let me get you back tonight. Um, my question is reasonably, I hate to do this after we're having a good time here, but I really do have a serious question about something you and I have talked about, and it has to do with mental health and serving people in the mental health system, because we're going to struggle a lot with that, given you know, the trends and, you know, as you dealt with before at the county in uh, prison population, we're really going to look to stem the tide uh, in terms of the pipeline going in, uh, and there's lots of ways to do that, early childhood development yeah. I think is an absolute key and we heard that here at the City Club recently. But could you uh, talk to us just a little bit about what we do now that we've de deinstitutionalized mental health, uh, what we could do at this stage going into the future about um, providing reasonable community-based care and then sometimes maybe some supervised care for people who are really a terrible threat to themselves and the community. That's why I'm glad you're at the county. You and Serena are going to figure this out. <laughs> but in seriousness, I, I, think, I, I think I've heard Vera say this as much as I have, that deinstitutionalization in 79 was probably the worst single vote we have made. And I'm always reminded that people like Ann Campbell, who lived downtown, and there were a number of voices that were saying, this, it sounds good, but this is not a good thing. This will not be good for our children. She had a chronically mentally ill son. And so we made a huge mistake. What we haven't done is either fund community mental health in any reasonable way, along with a bunch of other important social services, and we haven't found a way to integrate people into the communities that we, as a public policy, said we wanted them to do. So again, I mean, to me, probably the fiercest battle that is going to help in this arena is the one that you and Serena and the rest of the county and Beverly are going to be engaged in over siting, is when the neighborhoods are shutting down and saying, these people, we don't want them in our neighborhoods, um, they're just saying no to anyone now. And there was a lot of discussion about NIMBY and how we get past that. Another 
area where we need some very deep, creative new strategies that I don't have anymore. But it is, it's a huge problem, and uh, some of you may not know that Diane's mother, who was a wonderful woman, Burl Lynn, ran a group home in uh, Buckman for 20 years or more. So look at this product. Look at my daughters. These are people who grew up in s sort of communal households, and they are not dysfunctional, so. <laughs> That was for you, Deborah. <laughs> Jim Francisconi, City Club member. I didn't get the last name. <laughs> I guess just personally, Gretchen, thank you for uh, teaching me how to make public policy and how to be a public servant. I personally, and I know the council in the city is going to miss you, but thank I didn't you. do very well on getting you to be more patient. <laughs> I was the wrong teacher for that skill. I'm concluding I'm a little too patient. But anyway, on the question, I was interested when you got to your city accomplishments, you actually started with neighborhoods, not housing. And uh, on the issue of kind of gentrification in our neighborhoods, the things that you've done with BHCD, with Harney Park was built with, with community development funds, community organizers to the city are funded that way. Uh -oh. uh, streets are funded that way. Could you talk to us a little bit about, you know, why you did that and what lessons you've learned and where we're going in terms of the issue of neighborhood gentrification, the role of government, the role of citizens to avoid that? Well, what was the fellow's name? Ray Suarez yesterday at the, he had a, some very insightful things which I won't be able to recall about, recall all of, but about gentrification and what it means. When I was running for office, people said to me, woe is us, our houses are not worth what we paid for them five years ago. There was negative equity in most of the housing in Northeast Portland. And in a decade, though we have gentrified, I do fear that, that some people have been displaced, in the big scheme of things, this is probably a good thing. I don't think it will continue forever. And don't forget that we have thousands, several thousand new units of affordable housing in those neighborhoods that are protected forever. I didn't start, um, I need to be clear on this. I didn't, I talked about the neighborhoods as places we used our great housing experiment of community development in. So. I think it is a good thing. Families that had maybe a few thousand dollars in equity in their homes now have $80,000 of equity. What is the greatest source of personal wealth in this country? Traditionally, it's been our residences and the equity we had in them. So it isn't all bad. And I still, I mean, I am troubled. And Eric and I have, and Steve Rudman have spent hours trying to figure out how we protect against gentrification that forces people to leave their neighborhoods. But I still don't see it in the waves and to the degree that some communities have had. And hopefully we're not in a dangerous direction there. Oh dear. Um. <laughs> I didn't know the press got to ask questions at these Well, events. Are you a member of the city club? I am not. I am Bob Young, free, freeloading, freeloading journalist in the cheap seats. Um, Gretchen, I thought... Did you pay your five dollars to I, sit in the seats? I did not. <laughs> I, I, All right, but you can I ask me. You get a he is, I'm a socialist. Go ahead. Um, well, I thought, Gretchen, um, the media has been kind of conspicuously absent in your remarks today. And I would just be curious to hear about what you think um, have been the most notable changes in local media in the last 25 years or so? There is no good news. <laughs> no, I'm serious. There is no good news. We have worked our fannies off in a lot of arenas. And you think when we try to get attention to some of the wonderful things that have gone on in the neighborhoods we just don't now see i am so jaded that i did not notice there weren't media here today 
I saw these guys, and, you know, for all I know, that's channel 6, 8, and 12. <laughs> no. <laughs> Janet's here. I should say, for in memory of the people who aren't here that we love and have been talking about at my condo this morning, uh, my father was a newspaper man, and uh, so I grew up in a newspaper family, and I have a lot of feelings about the media and journalism and other things, but that's a whole nother speech, Bob. You can buy me lunch after I'm gone, and we'll talk about journalism. <laughs> Ms. Vera, fellow picketer, a point of personal privilege, I'm not going to ask a question, but I do, uh, I know that I've been a, <laughs> that both of us have been. <laughs> I took responsibility. Uh, and that's all right, because we still look at each other when we hear either one of our colleagues or some of the public, we look at each other and still roll our eyes the same way we did 25, 26 years ago. Uh, remember the other, the other day, poor um, Mark Landauer, who is the, the newest city lobbyist, Bob Landauer's kid, went to Whitman with Deborah. Poor guy said, workman's comp. <laughs> and Vera and I, not missing a beat, said, Workers' comp! <laughs> the law was changed in 1977! <laughs> and and I, that's really what I wanted to share with this group. Uh, some of us are, have gray hairs and others are younger and don't remember. But Gretchen's energy in the legislature, and even prior to the legislature, uh, on the issues of guns and firearms uh, was there uh, with Frank Roberts before she entered the legislature. In fact, her picture, and I think in some places my picture, were on bullseyes in Roseburg and Medford. LeGrand. And LeGrand. So she was there on that issue. She was there on the whole issue of women's rights and feminism long before many other women decided that that was something that they wanted to focus on. And I know that she joined us in sponsoring over 25 pieces of legislation to change the law, uh, including boxing <laughs> and wrestling. <laughs> I mean, nothing, nothing we'll get was get another excluded. woman governor no, out yeah, of that. Right. <laughs> but it was Wally Priestley I need to share with you that got the legislation passed. Uh, your efforts, your energies will never be forgotten. I want to thank you for your service to this state. And I want to thank you for your service to this community. I want to thank you for going to therapy together. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite an experience. <laughs> uh, and I want to thank you for your- We only went once. <laughs> <laughs> once was enough. <laughs> <laughs> we tried, <laughs> we tried. Uh, and I was also want to share with you, uh, and with the, not with you, but with the audience, your commitment to housing. And I, I commit to you that all the work that you carried on over the years will not be lost. This council will continue your work on housing and on the social issues that you care about. And that will be your legacy uh, for this community and for this city. So I want to thank you. That's the best legacy I could have. I admit it. John, John Leeper, City Club member. I too wish to commend you, ma'am, for your long public service. My question concerns your perspective on the relationship of the city of Portland with the other local jurisdictions in Multnomah, Washington, and Clackamas County. And I might add that I am a city club member, and I am also a resident 
of Washington County, and I am interested in your perspective on that relationship. It's another, it's another troubling area, and it was one of the, the disrespect for Metro and the Metro collective governments was one of the topics that got X'd out from my remarks because it, it is another troubling one. I think what troubles me the most is that people like Charlie and I have been on MPAC or whatever PAC it was over at Metro for a decade. Charlie worked on the charter. We have worked side by side with people and yet to hear mayors of neighboring communities to the east and county commissioners to the south stand up in public forums and beat on Metro for what they have or have not done, it's unbelievable to me. These are people who have been at the table for a decade who are as much responsible for the policies that Metro has promulgated as the Metro councilors themselves, and yet they hate Metro. So, I mean, if there is this much animosity among local elected leaders, how can we ever get the citizens of our communities to work together? It is a region. There is absolutely no way that was one of the continuing themes from the conference yesterday was, you know, this is crazy that we're talking about downtown or central city now, we call it, central city Portland. We can't discuss it in a vacuum. We're in a region. Vera's been saying we're the heart of the state now. It isn't just even regional issues, but I don't know that that answers your question. If well, you have an answer, I'd love to have it, and I bet Charlie would too. <laughs> I don't have an answer. However, I pointedly did not use the word metro. Oh. I was interested in your perspective on the city's relationship with the other jurisdictions. Well, that is the one forum where we interact together. We have no other uh, real communication as in terms of issues that are of importance to local jurisdictions. I think Metro is the forum. Metro is us. We are as much a part of that as we are of the region. Well, I... Okay, thank you very much. Sorry. <laughs> That's the respect you get when you're leaving. Gretchen, now last but not least, the arts. Um, many of you, I think, know that Gretchen's love of the arts certainly is lifelong in her involvement in the arts. Some of you may not know that actually throughout her political career as a state legislature, state legislator, Multnomah County Commissioner, and city council member, she's been steadfastly supportive throughout that time. And so as I contemplate my own transition and, uh, with you, Gretchen, ask uh, you to give us some advice and maybe give the people in this room some advice for how we can take the arts issues that we care so much about and like so many of the other issues that you're talking about and take them out to neighborhoods and to people and really create the support that we need to move this forward. I think there's a lot more support for the arts than we give ourselves credit for. Um, I think that there was a little blip when we did a poll a couple years ago for the city when Mike had the arts and it, you know, it said after 47, I guess, what should we cut? And arts came right up to the top compared to, let's, let's see, police, fire. I mean, obviously that's what you're going to do. But I think in the schools, the kids at my table, the Franklin High kids at the table yesterday at the workshop, that's what they talked about. They talked about missing their arts classes. It, it was phenomenal. I think the support is there, and I think if we can just keep reminding people that it is our cultural, and Ivy had another phrase that's not going to come to me about our, um, not intellectual, but our creative, creative capital, that this is the way people learn to be inspirational and develop the full a full personality is through the arts you don't do it with geography and reading latin you do it with art and i think the future will be brighter thank you very much